Hey, it's uh, Wednesday, and uh, I thought it might be helpful if I did a kind of a Bible study and posted it. I know a lot of you are used to having Bible classes on Wednesday night, and so uh, I just hate to miss that opportunity. I, I started to talk about God's judgments, and uh, the more that I, I dug into that and the more I looked at that, it, it's kind of like eating liver. Uh, you know how it is when you take a bite of liver and you chew it and chew it and chew it, and it just it gets bigger and bigger and bigger? Uh, that's kind of the way it is with this business of God's judgment. Uh, there, there were so many issues that were, that were cropping up when I talked about that that I decided I better give that a little bit more mature thought than uh, not do it quite as quickly as I wanted to. So what I'm going to do is I, I want to talk about the book of, of James. I, I think James has a lot of relevance for uh, what we're going through right now. Uh, let me just start by talking about an experience I had once where I, I just flat didn't know where I was. I mean, you, you may have had that same kind of experience to be, to be somewhere and to just be completely lost. Uh, you start out in one direction and you walk for a while and you think, no, not that way. And so you stop and you turn around and you move back the other way. And think, No, no, I've, I've been here before. I recognize some of this stuff. That's not the way. And, and you just look for something familiar and everything just looks alien. Uh, and, and I had to find my way. I mean, there was some place I had to be. I had to find it. And, and you stop and you look around and you're just feeling silly and incompetent, uh, just very lonely. And, and people are everywhere. And still, you just kind of feel stupid, feels foolish. I, I don't want to stop and have to ask them directions. It's just kind of a lonely feeling. Uh... And the need grew. Uh, it was a place that I had to be, that I, I needed to be, and I needed to find it. Uh, th there was just a sense of frustration that was growing with my, my helplessness. And you, you just walk up one alley and you reach a dead end, you turn around and come back and you start up another direction, and that's not where I want to be. And I'm thinking, how in the world do I find my way? I have to get there. And I ran onto a pillar. And on that pillar was inscribed a map. It was a picture of the place where I was. And it had all the pathways marked and everything was on it, labeled very carefully. And best of all, there was this little red arrow and it said, you are here. And suddenly all the frustration is gone. I just kind of relaxed all at once. I knew where I was. I knew how to get where I wanted to go. I mean, you just go straight down this way and you go past pennies and you take the first left to the under the sign that said exit and the first door on the right said men. And there I was. You know, sometimes you just need to get oriented. Sometimes you just have to know where you are. Uh, and, and I think that's why James is so powerful, because James does that business of orient, uh, orienting us. Uh, we, we're at a time where things are just kind of uneasy. We don't know what's going to happen over the next two or three days, much less the next few weeks or even few months as we uh, you know, are, are facing these adjustments to our economy and are facing adjustments to our social relationships and, and even facing adjustments in the church. I had a friend who was involved in work in a nursing home, and uh, I, I, I knew that their first activity of the day was always, uh, as the activities director, this person was the activities director, but their first activity of the day before breakfast was they gathered up all of those elderly people and they, they set them down wherever it was they were going to be eating breakfast, and they talked about what day is it? Is it Monday? Is it Tuesday? Is it Wednesday? Uh, what time, what month is it? Uh, January, February, is it the middle of summer? They talked about what time it was. Uh, they talked about the fact that they were about to eat breakfast. Just kind of set those people in the right spot, in the right space. 
We, you wonder, why did they go to the trouble to do that? I've noticed them do that in hospital rooms. They will put that up on the wall, and, and there will be this little uh, thing in magic marker up there that will say, today is Tuesday. Uh, your nurse is so-and-so. And so you'll have all of that information that orients you. But it, it reduces the uncertainty, and it reduces the anxiety. Uh, th they knew where they were. They knew why they were there. They... They knew what was happening. It sort of gave them some control, and they weren't just lost anymore. I got tickled talking to someone yesterday on the telephone, and uh, we, were, we were talking about uh, being at home and, and how weird that was and talking about routines and various things. And she said, uh, is this Tuesday or is this, or is this Monday? And I said, well, it's, it's Tuesday. And she said, oh, I just, I just completely lost track because I just, I just don't know what day it is anymore. Have you ever stopped just kind of running around in confusion and said, look, I need to know what's going on around here. I, I need to know what's happening with me. I, I just kind of need to get my feet on the ground. Uh, we, we run out of categories to put things in sometimes. Things are just coming at us so quickly and so randomly and so confusedly that uh, there's no way to account for our experience and, and no way to interpret what was whirling around. I, I think about Job in the Old Testament. You know, here is Job. Job's this wealthy man. He's got it all together with God. His ducks are all in a row. His kids are good. He's got a rich life. He's, he's doing, doing things the easy way, it seems like. And a messenger comes running in, torn clothes, bleeding, riding a half lame donkey. And he gasps out, the Sabaeans have attacked your fields and they've stolen all your oxen and donkeys and they've killed all your servants. And while he was still speaking, another one comes crawling through the door of the tent and his clothing is burned to tatters and his hair is smoking. And he said, lightning has killed all of your sheep and all of your servants. And while he was still speaking, this frantic Bedouin came riding in, screaming in fear. The Chaldeans have attacked and they've killed the servants and they've stolen all your camels. And and while he was still speaking, a wounded man limps into camp and says, a tornado struck your house, or it struck the house where your sons and daughters were, were feasting, and they're all dead. And here he is, impoverished and grieving, and he contracts leprosy. How do you take that? How do you describe that? How do you understand that? And a great deal of Job, the book of Job, is about Job trying to just understand where am I and who am I and, and what's going on here? Just overwhelmed by life, uncertain which way to move, uh, uncertain which way to step, just sort of paralyzed. It is helpful when someone would unfold a map and there's a picture of everything. It just kind of has it and it's right place, and, and there's a red arrow in one corner, and it basically says, you are here. Uh, take a look at, at the book of James. We're going to look at the first couple of three verses here first. Uh, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Now, now think about how disorienting that would be in the first place. The twelve tribes scattered among the nations. They don't have a real, real place to be. They don't have a real home. They're just kind of scattered out all over everywhere. He says, greetings. And then he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Uh, you know, it doesn't really make it any less painful. Uh, it doesn't make it easier to, to, to bear up under it necessarily, but at least it makes sense. Uh, now I can see what's happening to me. I, I can see what God uh, wants from me. And, and when, I, when I know the trials that I encounter are actually meant to accomplish something, when, when I know that the things that are happening to me that just seem to be so horrible at the moment, uh, are, are meant to equip me in new ways. I can learn new things and use this information in new ways and, and make me stronger and give me more smarts about how to live my life, to mature me so that I can be a, a person of deeper Christian character, uh, just to get a perspective on life, uh, what's important. 
uh, what I need to be, where I need to be strengthened. I, I think that's part of what's going on now. We are, we're really questioning what's really important about our lives. We're going to have to ask some questions. Do, 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 we, do we depend on God or do we depend on being able to go to Walmart and buy toilet paper anytime we want? Uh, do we, uh, what is it that really makes us happy? What is it that really makes us satisfied and fulfilled? Is it, have we found ourselves in Jesus or have we invested ourselves in a lot of other things? You know, if, I, if I'm oriented, if I know that the difficulties that are happening me, to me are meant for some purpose, I can dredge up the energy to make the effort and to keep on walking and to persevere. Now, that's, that's a different kind of orientation. Uh, maybe... Maybe that's more true to what James is writing to us about than, than anything that, that, that I have described up to this point. I, I can remember as a teenager, and I remember that as a difficult time. I, I was not a particularly happy teenager. I wasn't deprived by any sense of the imagination. I, I didn't have bad parents. Nobody beat me. Nobody abused me. But I struggled being a teenager because I, I was just not satisfied with virtually anything that was going on. Uh, here I am right on the threshold of adulthood, and I'm struggling with who I am and, and what I was meant to be. And, and I'm trying to establish my independence. And maybe all teenagers are like this, trying to establish independence, grow up and be an adult and have the rights of adults and the privileges of adults. But nobody will let you be one. They're always giving you orders about what time to be here and there and what time to come home and what time to get up and what to be doing with your time and what you can't be doing with your time. It was really an ambiguous time. I mean, I, I, I wanted to be my own person. I, I, I wanted to be free to make my own decisions, to determine my own directions, to think my own thoughts. And it just seems like the whole world was conspiring against you to keep you under its thumb to put you in his box. Everybody is still telling you what to do and when to do it and how to do it. And it's very easy to develop this uh, deep down resentment over just about everything. And, and that resentment then just kind of rolls over into rebellion. Uh, you, you doubt everything and you doubt everybody because the only one you can trust is yourself. Everybody else seems to be against you. And the only one on my side is me it's just me against the world, and this sullen anger sort of takes over. I'm, I'm not being treated right. Uh, this, is, this is not the, the way that I should be treated. And I may have to sit here and take it now, but uh, when I get out of here, you know, someday when I'm out on my own, I can make my own decisions and I can do what I'm going to do. There were times when my dad had to sit me down and he stuck his finger in my face and he said, you need to change your attitude. And he was exactly right. I needed to change my attitude. I, that's the sense I get in the book of James. Uh, he is not gentle. He is not beating about the bush, around the bush about anything. He basically says to them, you need to change your attitude. Uh, James is pretty cut and dry. I mean, this is the way it is. He, he lays it out there in black and white. He is insistent. This is the way you have to be. There is nothing ambiguous or uncertain about James. He just plops it down and, and hammers it to the wall and says, this is what life is about and this is what you must be. I, you know, I, I know a lot of problems revolve around depression uh, you know, just kind of beat, being beaten down by life until we can't go on and, and, and hopelessness has kind of taken over. I know there are depressed individuals. I, I suffer from, not depression, but I suffer from melancholy a lot. And I can always look on the bad side of things very easily and, and throw up my hands and just say, what's the use? I, I know there's problems with uncertainty. Uh, you know, I, I, I just don't know what to do anymore. I, I don't know how to act. I don't know what to, how to react. But I believe a lot of our problems really are rooted in this kind of sullen anger that we nurse. I am not being treated right, and people aren't letting me do what I want to do, and I'm not able to go, what I, uh, go where I want to go, and I'm not being able to do what I wanted to do. And anger is just kind of deep-seated resentment against people. 
They, it, it's me against the world. And, and anger then begins to translate into rebellion against everyone and everything. I am the only one who's right. And we get kind of suspicious of other people. They're, they're just trying to take away my freedom or they're just trying to hold me back. Trials, James says, these, these circumstances that we get into when things don't go the way we think they should go, should, shouldn't become, but they do become occasions for resentment. Here's what James says about that in verse 2. We're going to read a couple of verses that we read before already. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. James basically says, you need to grow up. You need to change your attitude. You need to persevere. Uh, and he focuses on, on perseverance. Now, he doesn't say be patient. Uh, sometimes that's the way we think of patience, you know, putting up with adversity without complaining. We're just supposed to endure. Uh, he doesn't say anything about enduring. He talks rather about perseverance, uh, continuing to do good, to, to be active in spite of circumstances, but keep on doing the right things, cheerfully keeping on about the business of being a Christian, even when things aren't going your way, or choosing to do the right thing, in any set of circumstances. That's what he means by perseverance. So here's the trick. How do you know the right thing to do? You know, that's the hard part. Uh, we, we might be willing to persevere if we just knew what to do next. James says in verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Uh, he talks there about wisdom. If you lack wisdom, then ask God and it will be given to you. Wisdom is the, the, the knowledge of the appropriate and right thing to do. Uh, it's kind of an ancient Hebrew concept. Wisdom is not about philosophy. and It's not about the purpose of the world. Wisdom is a very practical concept. Here is what you do. There's wisdom about how to build a bookcase. There's wisdom about how to repair a car. There's wisdom about, uh, uh, I started to say there's wisdom about raising children, but I'm not sure there's any hard and fast rules about raising children. But wisdom has that practical idea in it uh, of the appropriate and right thing to do. What to say when the king asks you a question. Uh, what to do when you get caught uh, making a mistake. Uh, how to react when things don't quite go the way that you want them to do. Do you need to know the right thing to do? Do you need to know the appropriate thing to do? James says you need to ask God. Now, I don't think James is talking about praying for wisdom. I, I don't think he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should pray. Uh, I, prayer is important, and I'm not trying to minimize prayer at all. And certainly, I think we need to pray to God and ask for wisdom. But I don't think that's what James is talking about right here. Uh, I think what he is doing instead is focusing on the source of wisdom. If you lack wisdom, then you need to ask God for wisdom. Uh, where are you going to get your wisdom? How are you going to find out how to act? You know, a lot of times we, we just simply go to the wrong source to find our way of acting, our wisdom. And we find out that we did it completely wrong. You know, we just give in to our feelings or we give in to our desires or we give in to common sense. And we find out that some of that stuff just doesn't work very well. So James is really focusing on the source of wisdom. Uh, what are you going to use as your standard to determine the... Uh, my computer just went black and so I had to start it over again. What are you going to use to, as your standard to determine the right thing to do? Are you going to get your wisdom from the world? Or are you going to get it from God? Are you going to do what you think is best? Or are you going to do what God says is right? Uh, are you going to go with the flow? Are you going to go with the crowd? Are you going to just kind of react to what feels right or what your desires say to you? Are you going to discipline yourself to do what God wants and the way God wants it done? This is James uh, 
chapter 3, verse 13, down through about 4 and verse 3. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, and so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You, you don't have because you don't ask God. When you ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Um, Look at the qualities of earthly wisdom there. Envy. They're not letting me be what I want to be. They're not letting me do what I want to do. They run everything. Who do they think they are? Uh, selfish ambition. Uh, I'll tell you what, I, nobody's going to stop me from, from being what I want to be and doing what I want to do. I'll fight them if I have to. It is that degenerate, sullen anger that is critical of everything and everyone and never satisfied with anything, refusing to forgive, refusing to give in, never gives in to anybody about anything, and they generally think themselves to be the wisest, most mature, and most spiritual. Uh, James will talk in chapter 3 and verse 1 about those who think they're teachers. Uh, and I think maybe that might be a little bit sarcastic. Uh, I, I think James is saying, you know, there are a lot of you out there that are saying, well, just let me tell you a few things. You know, I think I know something. I think I can tell you something. And James says the problem is you're teaching earthly wisdom. Is it earthly or godly wisdom? Now, as we get on into James and talk about what, what, what James wants to talk about, there will be some principles of earthly, of, I mean, of, of godly wisdom that, that James will leave with us. But the challenge is really laid before us. I mean, how are we going to act even when things aren't going our way? Look at what James says, verse 6 of chapter 1. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Uh, what does it mean to doubt? Well, for, for James, doubt means not being able to make up your mind which side you're on. Are you going to go with earthly wisdom or are you going to go with godly wisdom? Are you going to be on God's side or are you going to be on the world's side? Are you going to do things God's way or are you going to do things the world's way. It's not so much a philosophical issue of does God exist or not, or do I really believe the promises of God? The question is, what are you going to do with your life? Are you going to do it God's way or are you going to do it the world's way? The, the choice that's laid before us uh, in every situation is going to be, what am I going to do? Will I do it God's way or will I do what I think will work out to my best advantage? Will I treat people with God's love or will I protect myself? Will I absorb evil and not let it go past me and just keep it going? Or will I just get even? Will I live by the wisdom of the earth that says, hey, you have to take care of yourself? Or will I live by God's wisdom that says, love your neighbor as yourself? See, we have to make up our mind. We, are we going to serve the Lord or not? Are we going to trust the Lord or not? If you're going to trust Him, then we have to act like it. So that's, that's basically the introduction to James. And I know, you know you, you're going to get tired of staring at my face after a while. Uh, so, so I'm going to leave it right here. Uh, let's pray together. 
Holy Father, guide us in this difficult time. Give us a sense of purpose. Give us a sense of, uh, of being a part of something bigger than what we, what we feel like we are sometimes. Father, I pray that we might know that we are a part of your kingdom, that we are under your reign and your rule. And help us to act like that. Give us wisdom, Father. Give us the, the knowledge of the right, appropriate thing to do. And help us to open up and be, be willing to be obedient. Father, I pray it in the name of Jesus, who was our example of obedience. This Jesus who, who gave everything to you so that he could give everything to us. Father, we thank you for him and we pray in his name. Amen. Thank you and God bless you.